Hello, podcast family. My name is Duncan Masua, and welcome to our Farmer Mentor series, brought to you by Farmers Inside Track. Now, as always, in this special podcast series, we meet some of South Africa's top seasoned farmers and mentors, and they help us inspire new era farmers, sharing some of their trade secrets on crop and livestock management to even diversification strategies, and we even talk about finances. Now, joining us in this episode is Nolundi Msengana, and she's affectionately known as Mama Nolundi, managing 320 hectares of maize and soya in Sedibain Gauteng. Now, alongside her crop cultivation, she also raises cattle, sheep, and goats. A diverse agricultural approach showcases her commitment to the success of her business and she's joining us to share some valuable insights and even some of her trade secrets. Mama, welcome. Hello, Putin. Right. I'm fine, thanks. And you? (laughs) No, I'm doing very well. I'm definitely excited to be having this conversation with you. When um, I was introduced to you by a colleague in the Department of Agriculture, I was told that you are one of the biggest farmers in Gauteng. Is that accurate? <laughs> Not the biggest. I'm calling that. <laughs> For someone who doesn't know Ma Nolundi, tell us a bit about yourself. Who are you, apart from the farmer that we've come to know, who are you and where are you from? I grew up in Eastern Cape in a small town called Kala at Sengwe location. I attended primary school at Sengwe Junior Secondary, did my high school and tertiary education at Umtata. At school, I did e-commerce, so I grew up knowing that I'm going to be an accountant. After my tertiary school, I worked at Mnandi Fast Foods as a credit controller. That is from 1994 to 2007. I'm a mother of four boys and one girl, and also having a daughter-in-law. While I was still working at Mnandi Fast Foods, I opened my company where I was selling school uniform. Then opened a bridal shop where I was buying stock from India. I will travel to India to buy. And later I bought my stock in China. Most of the time I will be in Jobek for stock. And I started to be this side. And then at home I was having cattle, sheep, and the love of farming came back from there. And my father by then was also farming in Amtata. It sounds to me that there's a history of farming in the family. Does that come from your dad? Yes, there was farm at home. And then when my father moved to Mtata, then also he had farm in Mtata. So we grew up in an environment of farming. There were sheep, there were goats, cattle, and they were also planting. And today you've taken over that legacy, farming on 320 hectares in, in Gauteng. I cannot imagine that it could have been an easy journey for you. Take us through that, your journey into commercial farming. What inspired you to specialize specifically in maize and soya? In 2007, I applied for the farm. Then I got the farm. When I got the farm, it was December already. What I did, I took my livestock from Tata and bought some so that I can put them here in the farm. Because when you apply, they will ask you if you have got some, what is it that you have that you are bringing to the farm? So I had those cattle. Then when I arrived, when I saw the farm, the farm was 320 hectares. The Arab land was 225, then 82 grazing. Then I said, see, I'm not going to make it with livestock only because the Arab land was 225. So Mm -hmm. I had no choice. I had to plant Although I was raised in an environment of farming, I was not really interested in crop. Yeah. My love was in, was in livestock, but because of the farm that had arable land, I had to make choice to plant. And I suppose that has also contributed to the success of your farming business. Do you think you would have been where you are today without having taken that decision to plant maize and soya? No, I haven't. And the first year, When I started planting, I planted 30 hectares because it was already late, because it was December. When I harvested, I saw that I made good money. So the following year, I planted more hectares 
what helped me is to attend trainings because I attended trainings from Grand SA. Then the interest of Plandi was now more with the knowledge that I got from Grand SA. And in 2009, it was my first year that I planted with the trainings, with the Mendo. I had Mendo, that was Mr. Joro, who is also a farmer now. I was in 250 ton club of Grand SA. 250 tons? 250 tons. So I was there. And then again, I was also a nominee. I was one female amongst the males. We were 10 were nominees for the Grain SA Developing Producer of the Year. And from 10, I was on top three. Then again, on 2009, I got a Merit Award for Outstanding Achievement on Development Program for Farmers from ITO Focus. And I suppose to have these accolades, to get the awards that you mentioned, and also breaking ground in what is a very dominated industry, how would you say, how do you manage the integration of crop farming and livestock? You must have specific practices or or strategies in place that allow you to be as successful as you are. Farming is very difficult. And then what, what we do, it needs someone to focus. And then you need to love farming. We don't farm for money. At the end of the day, we all need money. But what we want, you must love it. You must have passion for it. You must have passion for it. So what is happening in the farm? What we do, we plant lands. And what we do with our lands, we apply fertilizer as per soil samples. We do soil samples as a recommendations that we get from the results of the soil samples. We make sure that we use those recommendations so that we do the right thing. And then we also practice the precision farming. The precision farming is adopted throughout the world to increase the yield. Then we also reduce the time of working on the lens and it ensures the effective of management of fertilizers and pesticides. You mentioned precision farming and that you brought it up. Do you practice that both in the crop section of your business as well as the livestock? Or is it just applied to the one? What we do in the livestock, we do vaccination programs and we make sure that the bulls and the rams are kept alone to avoid the inbreeding. We also manage the camps where we keep the livestock because what we have done, we've divided the grazing lands so that the the livestock don't overgraze because if they overgraze, then the quality of the grass becomes poor. Given the challenges that farmers often face, what would you say, what are some of the key lessons that you have learned from your experiences, both in in crop and livestock farming? As I said, farming is very challenging. We're facing the crime. Let me just tell you a short story. In 2012, we were selling green millies. Then my land cruiser was stolen. They killed the dogs with a poison. We found the dogs three days later. And then in 2019, 109 sheep were stolen. 2021, they came again, took 79 sheep, and we found the sheep in another farm's lands. The farmer was taken into the police custody and charged. That case didn't go anywhere because after some months, We just received an SMS that the case is withdrawn because of lack of evidence. When we called the person who was handling the case, he never take my calls. That is the challenge that we have. It was so painful when I saw the farmer took my ship and I couldn't do anything. I told myself that I'm not giving up. I looked up for solution on how to minimize the problem. Although every day on our groups we have the groups where we report the crime every yes. day, they report that 50 ships are stolen, 20 cattle, but we don't give up. We keep on pushing. We cannot give up because people are stealing. We must yes. work and do what we said we are going to do as farmers. That was quite a big loss that you suffered there with your livestock. How does one recover from that? You don't recover because you're not going to get those ships. You're not going to get back what you have lost, but you just tell yourself that, let me be strong, let me work, let me go forward. As much as sometimes you get sick, thinking that if I took my stock and sold it, I will have gotten maybe 100,000 or what. 
But because they have stolen it, you have lost, you have lost. There's nothing that you can do. Just keep on pushing and mm. tell yourself that this is what I'm going to do. No one is going to stop me. We're definitely glad that you have that approach to challenges that you face within the agricultural space. Of course, you know, without farmers, we wouldn't have food on our tables. And if a farmer had to give up after every challenge, one could only imagine where we would be as, as a country. Or the country. So what's inspiring about your story is that you're quite big on diversification, you're the livestock element, and then there's the crop side as well. With diversification, it's obviously not a, a cheap practice. It requires investment. It requires money. How do you approach financing and finance management when it comes to operating a farm that is mixed farming? Diversification helped me to reduce the risks of the business. Like I'm saying now, uh, that when they stole my ship, I had maize that I planted. I knew that after some time, I will get money from maize. So it helps to do diversification in any business because it keeps me calm during difficult times. And if one market fails, success on the other will reduce the impact of the failure. If the price of maize is going down, we don't sell the maize. We keep the maize in the silos. For a cash flow, we sell the livestock until the prices are up so that we can get what we have lost. In Lundi, of course, there's this conversation around climate change. And, you know, at some point it was quite a scary topic for farmers because, number one, we didn't necessarily understand climate change. We also didn't necessarily understand what climate change meant for my farm. But now we are in a space where we have a better understanding. How do you adapt your farming practices to cope with climate change and what recommendations do you have for other farmers facing similar challenges? Climate change poses challenges to farmers' whole world. What we do in the farm, we implement practice like no-till, crop rotation. We are already adapting to a climate change by changing selection of crops and timing of the field operations. My advice to other farmers is to invest into technological advanced implements so that you minimize breakdowns. For example, if now you are working with an old planter and it breaks, it will take you time to get parts compared to a new planter, like a 2021 planter. When it breaks, you get the parts now. 2007 planter, when are you going to get the, the parts? It can take you a month. And with the climate change, it can rain for two weeks. If it rains for two weeks and you don't have the parts, what is going to happen is that you must wait again. And when you get the parts and you are ready to plant, you cannot plant. So my advice is for us farmers to invest on the implements so that you can minimize the breakdowns. It's quite inspiring because what you describe sort of sounds a lot like conservation farming, you know, sort of working with Mother Nature instead of against it. You also mentioned technology, which of course plays a significant role in modern agriculture. What are some of the specific technologies or tools that you find particularly beneficial for managing your farm? When you put a fertilizer, you can program it to how many bags you put in this land. It's not like the, the old planters that we were using. So we, now we use the new planters when you require to plant fertilizer and you, the pesticides, you just use them and it just spread them uniformly across the entire fields according to the requirements that the area needs. Mano Lundi, you've been doing this for over two decades now. You clearly know what it is that you're talking about. You've paid your school fees. You've lost. You've had big financial losses. To someone who's listening to this episode right now and they either want to diversify their business as you have done or they want to perhaps start farming, what advice do you have for farmers listening right now? To those who want to enter in agricultural sector, I particularly the crop and livestock, I would say one must try not to do everything by themselves. While you may be able to do everything yourself, it is not wise. Seek out people who can help you plan to grow no matter what size you start. 
the most important thing I can say is to be hungry to learn. Learning is the fuel for new ideas and improvement. Always recognize that you don't know it all and be humble enough to seek advice, to learn from other farmers for the purpose of growing your business. 20 years into the business, are you still learning every day? Yes, and I'm still going to learn tomorrow. With the climate change, new things are coming. So you cannot do what you were doing in 2020, in 2024. So there are changes then. That means you must learn. I'm not afraid to ask. If I don't know anything, I ask someone who has done it so that I can do it. And if I have done it and failed, I will go and ask again. Wow, wow, wow. What an amazing story of a farmer who has overcome many challenges in her agricultural journey. And today, she's sitting neatly on 320 hectares farming maize, soya, and also raising livestock such as cattle, sheep, and goats. Inspired. Right, it's now time for our farmer question. And this week's question comes from Sipelo Jakuja who has a question about choosing the right cattle breed for his area. And his question is answered by Sandile Nzuza, the Bonsamara SA breed advisor. My name is Sipela Jagoja. I am an aspiring cattle farmer in the Eastern Cape. I would like to know, when it comes to cattle breed selection, what should I take in consideration in terms of my climate and environment condition? Well, it's more of getting an adaptable animal more than looking into the climate and ad- environmental conditions. By that, I mean you want to get an animal that is adaptable to your environment without having to go into the nitty gritties of how your environment is. So you want an animal that survives in your area. So the best way to always go about it is to always look at the breeds that are in your area look at their condition. Should they have nice, smooth, shiny coats that already tells you that's a very adaptable animal. So it means it'll survive, produce and reproduce in in that area or in those environmental conditions. We know that a lot of people tend to make, I'll call it a mistake because it's understandable for stud breeders who need to source genetics from all over the place. But for a subsistence and a commercial farmer, they usually travel about 100, 150 kilometer radius to get an animal, which yes, there is a difference in terms of environment, but the animals tend to adapt better within that radius. And it also makes economic sense, not driving too long a distance to go get an animal. But it's always better to buy an animal from your area. So if you're looking for a bull, always look for a bull from breeders within your area, because that already assures you that you're going to get an animal that's already adaptable. And because remember, adaptability is very important. An animal that hasn't adapted basically It gets sick easily. It means it can contract diseases. It can lose its condition easily. And that affects productivity. It affects the animal being able to produce a calf for you or the animal being able to sire calves for you. So you want to make sure that you choose an animal that's rather adaptable to the environment more than looking at the environment and saying, I get so much rain, it gets this cold, therefore I want a breed like this and that. Look for animals in your area those breeds in your area will tell you in terms of the adaptability of the animals that you can find in your area and then you can buy there if you can afford any animal definitely you can go get it but i'm telling you there you you'll see should the animal not be an animal adapted to the type of climatic conditions that you have that animal will not survive and as i'm saying you do not necessarily go and look at your environment then pick an animal but rather look at the animals you have in your area the breeds you have in your area, look at their adaptability to the area. That way you can then find, I guess I can say, better adapted breed in that area. That's it for this episode. Join us again next time when we meet another seasoned steward of the earth, ready to guide the next generation of farmers. Also make sure you don't miss out on the exclusive article covering this episode by visiting www.foodfromzanzi.ca.za make sure that you are the first to read it to our amazing audience of farmers and agriculture enthusiasts thank you for joining us and remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss any of our episodes from me duncan masiwa our technical producer megan van der Fendt, and the rest of hashtag team food from zanzi thanks for listening